the Triathlon Show 282. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I interview Dr. Simon Marshall and Leslie Patterson, husband and wife, and you heard Leslie uh, a few weeks ago in an interview where we talked about her coaching philosophy and training philosophy, but they together, Simon and Leslie, are the authors of the book The Brave Athlete, Calm the Fuck Down and Rise to the Occasion. So it's a sports psychology book, very well written. I listened to it as an audiobook a couple of years ago and I loved it. And in this episode, we'll basically discuss several of the most important messages covered uh, in that book, including just the general getting an understanding of the inner workings of your brain and then how to how to work with the brain rather than against it, as well as some specific scenarios and common use cases that triathletes face on a regular basis in racing training and in the day-to-day life. Uh, one thing that I would like to ask before we move on is uh, if you are enjoying the podcast, it would be amazing if you could leave a rating and a review for it on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you get your podcasts at that uh, allows you to write r- ratings and reviews. That really helps a lot. Before we get into the interview, a big thanks to our sponsors, Roka. Roka are the world leading manufacturers of wetsuits, tri suits, swimskins, goggles, high performance eyewear, and prescription glasses and sunglasses. In their traditional triathlon lineup of products, we have uh, amazing successes like the Maverick wetsuit lineup, the Viper swimskin, the Gen 2 Elite Aero tri-suit lineup, and many others that are designed from the ground up with the simple mission of making you go as fast as possible on race day, whether we're talking about in the water with a wetsuit or a swimskin, or on the bike with the aerodynamic uh, attributes of the Gen 2 Elite Aero tri-suit, as well as con- comfort and function on the run, of course. But Roka also have their, their lineup of sunglasses and prescription glasses. And Roka are taking a bold new approach to this eyewear category. They have features and innovations like ultra lightweight materials, blue light blocking coding options, their patented Geeko anti-slip technology that makes it impossible for the glasses to fall off your face. Uh, When you're purchasing the glasses, you have experiences such as you can take an online vision test to update your prescription and much, much more. Uh, So it's really a great, great new product lineup. I love products like the Matador sunglasses and the Rory prescription glasses. So check all of that out and get 20% off your order with the promo code that you can get on roca.com forward slash TTS. And thank you to Zen8. The Zen8 swim trainer helps time-crunched athletes get consistency in their swim training, even if you don't have time to get to the pool as often as you as you would like, or if the pools are still closed due to the pandemic. Uh, they also have training plans, and uh, their recent training plan that they put together with the BMC Pro Triathlon team actually combines training in the pool with training at home with the Zen8 swim trainer. You can try that plan for free for a couple of weeks before deciding whether to enroll in the paid program. But irrespective of if you're on the Zen8 uh, training program or not, having the swim bench gives you a fantastic option to make sure that you can always maintain consistency, even if it's just through a short, intense session, because that's all you have time for. You can use that to work on on high-end power or even work on technique, which you can easily do because you can actually see what you're doing and you have a better perception of what you're doing on land rather than in the water you can get 20 percent off your swim trainer with the promo code that you can get on zen8swimtrainer.com forward slash tts without any further ado let's get into the interview with simon marshall and leslie patterson Today's guests on that triathlon show are Simon Marshall and Leslie Patterson. Leslie was recently on the show, but Simon, you're new, uh, but welcome both of you. How are you doing? Thanks. I'm doing great. We're doing great. Thanks. Uh, it's great to have you back, Leslie, and welcome, Simon. Can can you, Simon, since uh, you haven't been on before, introduce yourself and your background to the audience? 
Yeah, so uh, I'm Simon, Marshall Leslie's husband, uh, and I'm a uh, expert in sports psychology. My PhD, uh, undergraduate, masters and PhD are in sports science and then later more specifically in sports psychology. And moved out, I'm British, uh, same as Leslie, moved out to California where we now live to be a faculty member uh, in public health. But my area is applying principles of psychology to health and medicine. So I was a professor at the University of California here in San Diego um, for, for I don't know, 12, 14 years, and then left that to do consulting, helping athletes manage their mindset uh, to improve, to optimize. And so, and that's obviously, I met Leslie through, I'm a cyclist. Uh, so I met Leslie on the bike as a triathlete and then. What better uh, um, um, combination than a, a sports psychologist and, and a professional athlete? <laughs> <laughs> Did, had you had you met triathletes before as part of your work, or were you familiar with the types of personalities that Not triath really. triathletes are? Yeah, now, now I'm very familiar. As again, as a cyclist, they used to ride with some triathletes. Those triathletes were brave enough to come out with just cyclists groups, but. Um, no, so learning a little bit more, marrying into the sport, and then obviously doing the sport myself because I've married into it. I would never be forgiven if I didn't try to do triathlons as well. Uh, and then started to do a bit more research in triathlon about the psychology of triathlon and seeing the kinds of personalities and temperaments that get attracted to triathlon, which is actually quite a unique sport in terms of personality. So I've learned a lot over the last 20 years about the psychology of triathlon and triathletes in particular. And it's been, fasc it's been a fascinating journey. Yeah, and we'll get into that uh, as we get further into <laughs> this, uh, this interview for sure. Uh, but uh, so one thing that uh, I'm sure a lot of listeners are already familiar with and many may have read the book already. I did listen to it on Audible and I thought it was great and you narrated it yourself. But your book, The Brave Athlete, uh, is uh, one that has been out now for, is it two years? that uh three three years will be four it was came in 2017 so it'll be four years this year yeah so uh, quite well, quite a while now so we're it's still going strong so we're pleased so time flies yeah so so what was the reason that you you both decided to to write that what was the the genesis of it yeah so i think it was because um obviously this unique combination right me being that professional out there a professional athlete out there really doing it us having a coaching uh, business and just kind of interacting with so many different athletes with so many different problems and then size unique set of skills you kind of put them all together and um and we started to really sort of come up with great uh, sort of ideas philosophies uh, size background in science mind in the practical aspect we wanted to bring it together uh, to create this book to really help people out there with all the issues i'd had what our athletes had had and uh, yeah just uh, having something that was accessible yeah, and, and just to reiterate some of the things that Leslie said, so one of the big pieces for us, important parts, is to, and this is one of our philosophies of how we do the work we do, is that you always want to meet the athlete where they're at. You want to talk in the terms of the, the way they think, the words that they use, how they express things, how they tell you, how they're feeling. And unfortunately, much of the self-help psychology uh, work, you know, if you pull a book off the shelf to help you become a mentally tougher athlete as an endurance athlete. A lot of the techniques, they're still, they're, they're kind of still they're staying in the academic ivory towers, right? They're, the research shows, the history shows, the studies show, but there's a disconnect between where athletes, what it feels like to be an actual athlete. And so the approach that we took with this book is that we started with what are the things that athletes tell us that they struggle with, using the exact words that they use to tell us what they struggle with. And they became the chapter headings of our book itself. So we actually, we don't talk about, you know, stress management during a half Ironman or whatever. We talk, you know, athletes tell you, I need to harden that F up or I just, you know, I just quit. And I don't know why I just quit. I just sort of start. So that's the, that. so we try to find, li listen to the language that athletes use. We sort of decompose the issues they're having and then apply the principles of psychological science using techniques that you might not see in traditional psychology books. And so that's where, so our approach is this sort of quite unique blend of where rubber hits the road, what it feels like to the athlete, but also how psychological science can help understand and improve it. Yeah, it's a, it's a cool format. I have the uh, the table of contents here uh, to the side and 
and you have uh, headlines, the chapter headlines like, I wish I felt more like an athlete. I don't think I can. Uh, you have other athletes seem tougher, happier, and more badass than me. I feel fat, uh, and so on. So so that's just to give the listeners an idea of uh, of what you mean when the the things, the problems, the athletes come with themselves to you, what, uh, that they become the chapter headlines. Uh, but uh, one thing that I'm curious about is that is the feedback you've gotten over the last four years, coming up on four years, what are the things that people have found the most valuable? It might be just in terms of concepts or particular topics that they have found valuable. What is hilarious is almost every single athlete that's reached out to us was, oh my God, you wrote this for me. <laughs> <laughs> So that which is which is great, right? You want to really uh, cut to the core, and the essence of who that person is, and and luckily I think we've achieved that with the book. But I'd say one of the biggest things um, is the brain mental model. How does your brain uh, function? You know, the chimp brain, the professor brain. That just as a sort of metaphor has really run true with almost everyone, and just by knowing how your brain functions is almost a solution in itself. And anything to add to that, Simon, from your perspective? No, I think, that, yeah, again, the, the, the starting off, and again, we often use the analogy of these car mechanics is that, you know, you take your car has a squeak or a leak, you take it in, you write a big check, the squeak's gone, but you don't really know what they've done or they explain to you, you don't really understand it. And so we think that we, as athletes, if we can learn how to be our own car mechanics, we know a little bit about why the brain does the things it does, the situations that our particular heads are going to not like or hate and what we can do about it really starts with understanding a little bit about the neuroscience of the brain. And so that's the way we start with all of us. And so the goal would be, yes, we can give you all these like buckets of strategies that might help. But if you understand the underlying mechanics, you can start to develop your own techniques or know, okay, now I know why that net will never work. Or now I know that sort of family of strategies, that's why it works. And I do this and I didn't really know why, but it, now I can see why that would work. And we've had a lot of athletes that tell us, I do this and it's not in our book, but it makes total sense given how these different aspects of our brain interact with one another. So I think that that's been probably the, the biggest thing. And I should, I should say the second probably lesson that I've learned from the people who've read it, they've said to us, you know, I got given it, I'm not really an athlete or I'm not an endurance athlete, but it's really helped me understand my relationship, my kids dealing with a stressful work environment. And that's probably the biggest you know, uh, worst kept secret of our book is that it's not just about sport. You know, we all are born with the same ingredients and how we approach situations that give us anxiety and pressure and stress and ner make us nervous or we need confidence or belief. It, it applies to all of these domains in life. So it really is a book that can help you just human better, not just be a better athlete. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And uh, let's move straight to talking about the brain in a bit more detail then as the underlying <laughs> principle for, for all of this. Yeah, so um, one of the, and again, this is a big discussion, uh, but in a, in a nutshell, what we do is we like to get athletes to think of their brains as they've got more than one brain. There's multiple structures and pathways that are happening in the brain. And we know that that's a simplification of the science. We know that you don't actually have different brains. And we also know that no one part of our brain is responsible for one thing. If there's one thing that we've learned in neuroscience is that your brain is really better described as a network that uses algorithms, right? Rather than, oh, the top left-hand corner, that's responsible for this. The bottom right-hand corner, we know that that's not the case. However, the, the analogy that we use of this, you've got this chimp brain, a professor brain, and a computer brain, three types of brains, is more of a function rather than a, a specific structure or location. And we know that they all operate fairly differently. They, they're, they're not independent, but they operate in quite different ways. For example, your chimp brain, which is what in scientific terms is your limbic system, about the size of an avocado, right in the center of your head, uh, operates to give us uh, all of our emotions. It doesn't think rationally. It doesn't use facts and logic like the wrinkly frontal cortex, the professor brain. It, it only deals with urges, cravings, emotions, the fight or flight response. That's where all our nerves and anxiety comes from and so on. 
And that part of our brain has been there longer than any other part of our brain. Millions of years ago, that was the dominant part. And in some animals, it still is the dominant part of their brain. It's a stimulus response organ that tries to keep us away from harm, encourages us to procreate all the basic functions of being an evolved human on Earth. And of course, the wrinkly part, the frontal cortex, that the uh, prefrontal cortex does all the thinking for us. That's the rational part, only facts and logic it deals with. And that's when you think of who you are and the kind of person you are and all the stuff you have to do, planning, taxes, buying a home, whatever, all the complex, that's all frontal cortex, that's all professor brain. And these two parts of our brain fight all the time. In fact, most of our mental anguish in life is because of these two brains are fighting. On the one hand, your chimp brain is saying, avoid that. What are you doing? You could die. Are you crazy? Get away from that in very sort of Fisher Price language that it has. Versus our professor brain is saying, it's just a triathlon. Don't worry. The world's not going to end. You know, you've paid for coaching and you need to keep doing this or it's good for your health. And so you've got an intellectual versus an emotional argument going on. Unfortunately, evolution has given the chimp brain big powers so that it always or most of the time wins that fight, right? And what, for example, one of the powers it has is that it processes information from our senses, what we look at, what we hear, what we can smell and taste. It processes that sensory information five times quicker than the rest of our brain. So meanwhile, your smart, uh, wrinkly frontal cortex, your professor, the real you, is already too slow to know that there's a threat in your environment. And the best example of this is what we call the startle reflex. You know, if you've been in an open ocean and something brushes up against your leg, and you're like, oh, well, what, what, you know, what, you're immediately, before you've had a chance to think about what it could be, what it might be, and what it is, you've got this visceral, quick lightning speed reaction. So because that react, once that reaction happens, it sets off a cascade of, of other hormonal and, and neurotransmitter uh, 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 reactions that changes in our brain chemistry and our body chemistry that are already happening at lightning speed. Our adrenal glands on top of our kidneys start pumping out adrenaline, cortisol, the stress hormone, all these happening, all this stuff starts happening before our pro professor brain has had a chance to even catch up. So this is why nerves, for example, or getting anxious before an event is a really difficult problem to solve because the train has already left the station by the time that you re recognize what's happening. So five times quicker is one power. The other power is that it's five times stronger than our weedy computer, uh, our weedy professor brain as well. So the moment it detects a threat to us, and we can talk about what those threats are, it throws a chemical brick at your professor brain to slow it down. And on the face of it, that might seem crazy, right? My powers of logic are gonna be really helpful to decide, hang on a minute, chimp, you're not in danger. You can calm down because he's holding a ruler, not a gun, you're not in danger. But of course, we can't, as an evolutionary uh, survival mechanism, that's a terrible strategy to use. If you went and discovered what the threat was and tried to analyze it to figure out whether it was dangerous, you might get it right eight times out of 10, but the two times you get it wrong, you're dead. So it's a, you're better off being far more conservative. So your chimp brain releases about 30 neurotransmitters into our frontal cortex to slow it down, to stop you thinking your way out of what it thinks is a potentially life and death situation. So now the one or the few powers that you do have to talk to yourself, okay, it's just a this, it's just a that, is virtually ineffective. And as any athlete knows, or they try to look at themselves in the mirror and say, I'm strong, I'm confident, I know I can, I know I can, some of the, what the self-help books tell you to do, it doesn't work and it will never work. It's because you're fighting biology that's been designed by mother nature to get you to run away, to fight for your life, to hide, to make excuses about why you shouldn't be in that environment or to do something that you're good at and not that where you could be embarrassed or humiliated and so on. So the, the mental fight that most of us are in, athletes, 
spouses, employees, come down to, in its essence, the battle between these two parts of our brain trying to take control of you to say, this is what we should do. And that gives us a lot of ang angst. And so our book is really designed to tell you, explain what's happening there, but to give you clever strategies to how do you beat someone that's five times quicker, five times stronger than you. You have to be a bit sort of sneaky and, and manage that part of your brain in clever ways rather than just arm wrestle it into submission, which never works. Yeah, that, that's a really excellent summary there. And I'm really curious to hear <laughs> about uh, the strategies for uh, for outsmarting that chimp. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, but before we do, uh, Leslie, I want to hear from your personal uh, athletics career, whether it's in racing or in training, uh, do you have an example of when you have like that you in hindsight realize that okay that was an example of my chimp brain like beating my uh, beating my professor brain uh, and you maybe didn't realize that it was going on at the moment but but in hindsight it was yeah so i used to always have a major freak out uh the day before um my exterior races the big races when i was pre-riding the course on the mountain bike because that's what we tend to do so that we can check the lines and know which parts are technical and uh i would just always lose my shit and i didn't really understand why like i mean just lose it couldn't even bump off a curve and it was just my chimp having a tantrum um and you know and and my prof professor brain not being sort of just not having the right uh, uh, tactics the right skills to be able to understand that that was happening and how to mitigate it or let it out or you know a uh, uh, sort of win that fight so to speak so yeah so if you see me on the on, on the course the day before the race and I'm I'm losing it then uh, probably my chimp is going haywire <laughs> yeah that's a good one so so let's move on to uh to how to maybe beat your chimp or outsmart him yeah, yeah well the first thing to say is that your chimp is also your friend right it's the part of your brain that has good intentions to keep you alive to stop you being embarrassed so we don't always want to think of it in terms of it's this adversary you know that in, in your superhero movie in your head it's the bad guy the evil guy or gal it can often be really helpful and and, and, it, and i'll give you some examples of a helpful chimp in a moment but the most The majority of issues that we have are quieting down or talking our chimp off a ledge that's trying to convince us that this is the last thing that you should be doing this morning. Strapping yourself into a into a skin tight neoprene suit, walking into a washing machine, getting punched and kicked while you're swimming to come out last in your wave to be laughed at. And what are you doing? And you feel already a bit silly in your life. All of the stuff that's happening. So. One of the things that we now know in some of the uh, neuroscience literature is when you start to, and then, okay, this is a, a way to manage your chimp. If you give your chimp the ability to just let it out what it's most concerned about. So you actually think of your chimp as a person, like give it a name or a character in your head. What is he, he or she saying to me right now? And so we call this your chimp talk. So your chimp talk is a very specific brand of crazy that it speaks to you. And it's very specific to your upbringing, your experience, the kind of temperament and personality you have. So my chimp, for example, what it's most concerned about is, for example, is social approval, right? Getting, being liked by people. Other people, it might be to do with body image. Other people's, it might be my chimp has to, uh, uh, has to they don't, doesn't feel as though it has the right to be there. So it always tries to demonstrate its competence and so on. So all of your, all of our chimps have different. So you have to be really aware of the kind of themes in your own chimp talk. And you only get that by listening to it and not interrupting it. So you write down, if we say to people, okay, I want you to give yourself, what's the worst self-talk you could possibly imagine? Write it down or say it out loud. Oh, you're such a loser. You're, you're a cyclist. So you swim like a seahorse you know, toe dragger, you're going to come out of the water last and people are going to be like, what are they? They're not a real athlete. And it's all nonsense. It's not rational because it's your chimp brain. Or the morning of a race and you've got the butterflies, you feel nauseous. You're like, why do I do this to myself? There's nothing about this is enjoyable. And then you get through the race and you're like, oh my God, let's do it again. It's just a weird sort of self-abusive cycle that we go on. But the morning of, your chimp is saying, find a way to get out of this. Find a way to get out of this, right? So you could be, sometimes it could be really, 
uh, 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 overt, like, well, you are actually having a bit of a sore throat or you want to be careful about that injury or it's too far to drive. And if you're honest with yourself, they're kind of excuses, but you kind of make them out to be re- legitimate. Sometimes they could be, oh, it's raining out or, oh, it's just going to be a training day because I'm kind of tired. So I don't actually want to put myself on the line and see if I can get on the podium or whatever. I'm just going to go through the motions and so on. So we're always cutting deals with ourselves. So what we want to try and do is listen to the chimp talk. And here's the weird little kind of biology hack is that if you listen to it, say it out loud, write it down for long enough so that it's you start to there's no more new ammunition that your chimp can come up with it's saying the same things over and over again based on that theme in other words you're exhausting your chimp you're not trying to like you're saying how about it give me everything you got and after for most people that's three to ten to twelve minutes it takes is that it you're saying now the say yes i get it i'm fat and i i'm slow i get it. anything else you got well you're a sports psychologist and you're still no good so no one's going to hire you if they see you at the back of a sp- – okay, I'm not, I'm not a very fast athlete. I'm a sports psychologist. I'm fat and I'm not – anything else you got? No, I can't think of – so now once that happens, your limbic system, blood flow to your limbic system starts to drop. Electrical activity in your limbic system, the threat detection centers start to calm down. Cortisol drops, testosterone, um, adrenaline drops, and so on. And so it's not the same as saying, I'm going to do a 30 second negative self talk. And then, regardless of whether my chimp is exhausted, I'm just going to go on. That ha- yeah, you've got to do it for several minutes. Yeah, you have to exhaust your chimp. You have to do it so there's no more stuff and you're not interrupting it with your professor brain saying, I know this is silly to think this. I know this could never happen, but they're all rationalizations. The chimp talk, straight plain chimp talk, is just nasty. You fucking suck, right? What are you doing? Yeah, it's all stuff that we know isn't true, but you have to learn what that is and you do it for long enough so it can exhaust itself. And normally we'll do it for at least uh, two minutes, three minutes, maybe even longer, like five or ten minutes. It depends how deep it runs. But really letting it out, we call it a chimp purge. So that's one of our techniques. It's a chimp purge. So imagine it's almost like if you have had an argument with someone, you, maybe you've been crying and you almost cry your way out the other side. You're so exhausted. It's the same phenomenon. It's the same uh, 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 chemistry that's going on in your brain. Yeah. yeah. So that's one. That's one. That's, that's one. one. That's one. To and, and a very pre- specific practical tip for athletes is when do I do this? And so you drive to the race site before, if you're on your own. Otherwise, you look like a crazy person. Before you get out the car to do your warm up or to sign in or whatever, you just sit there in the car and just rant for two or three minutes. Or you've registered, your bike is racked, and then you go on your run warm up and you just stop or you walk around the back of a tree when no one around. You just go through this exercise. So, all of these things are within an hour, half an hour of you actually starting. You feel fresher. You know, every, everyone's a little bit different. My chimp purge always comes the day before. So it's kind of around the press conference or when I've been around a lot of the other athletes and I've seen them for the first time um, or I've seen the race course for the first time or any one of those things. So it's very unique to each individual. But as long as you're aware of of when that might be necessary for you, then you start to kind of almost program it in. I think a a race situation that we are talking about here is uh, is a great example of a very stressful situation where it's natural that, uh, that pretty much anybody would have some sort of self-doubt or chimp talk to come out but but are there any other examples in just your normal day-to-day routine as an athlete where of how i mean i'm sure there are but i get, basically want to get to what are some examples of things that might be chimp talk that we don't even realize it in our normal going about our training or things around training or revolving around i had one this morning (laughs) yeah i mean it can happen in any session right for me specifically this morning it was a couple of my buddies were ahead of me in the bike and normally i stick with them on, on these intervals and i wasn't and i just was very tired and frustrated and i just sort of you know the chimp was just going wild you know they don't get how tired i am they don't understand what's going on in my life they're this uh," you know and i just sort of i kind of let it out and was aware of it and then it just kind of calmed me down uh, for the remaining interval so it can happen then um it can happen yeah just uh uh, gosh, it can yeah. really happen anything. In fact, most of the talk that we goes on in our head is probably chimp talk. The majority of things that we say in our head is chimp talk. 
And so when you look at what your limbic system, your chimp brain is most concerned about, you've heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and stuff. So obviously being secure, being safe, physically safe, having enough shelter, food and water, they're all basic physiological needs. If they're threatened, your chimp is going to freak out. So when you're hungry and grumpy or hangry, it's all chimp. Um, if there's a chance and the other thing your chimp is, is threats to your ego. And what that means in real language is if your chimp detects that you may either be humiliated, embarrassed or shown to be inadequate, especially in front of other people, your, that's a, a huge threat to your chimp. So when Leslie talks about, you know, the riders I can usually ride with and they're a bit faster than me and I'm so, so angry. So why is that so upsetting? I mean, it's just you're doing your own thing. You're going as hard as you can. Why is it? Well, if you keep you know, doing that Socratic reasoning, so why is that so important to you to stay with them? Well, it's an ego threat, right? I'm, I want to be fitter or stronger or to be able to stay with them. So, those, so they may not be thinking, what's the matter with Leslie? Is she not as good anymore? Or she's not as good as I thought she was. Or all these threats to our ego. So most of the mental anguish we have comes from, is predominantly from our chimp talk. And you know if your chimp is in charge, because you ask yourself a simple question, right now, do I want to think or feel like this? And if the answer is no, your chimp is in charge of you. You don't know that, but it is. So anytime you say, no, I'm sort of, I want to feel like this, then there's a good chance that your professor brain is actually in charge. Because when you ask someone to self-reflect, do you want to think like this? You go through a process that re requires your professor brain to, to pros and cons. Well, I know this, this, but that's all right. Yeah, no, I, I actually want to think like that. That's, an in, that's a cognitive exercise. So, yeah, that's a good way of knowing which brain is actually in charge of you at any one particular time. But when you, the instances where you need your chimp, so come on, you know, oh, I don't want you intellectualizing the reasons why you don't want to do something and you just need to suck it up, bring out the angry, you know, that's when sometimes a chimp in charge is really helpful. Brute strength, or as we call it in Britain, riding or running on piss and vinegar, they say it's a phrase, you know, just brute strength, just pushing through, not overthinking, just, you know, going at it. That's using your chimp, that sort of momentum of just a blunt, instrument like a locomotive battering stuff down yeah so so is it so is it the case that some people may be more of the chimp is really like being really conservative with them and trying to hold them back and protect them from everything and never really pushing through their comfort zone so to say whereas others it might be almost the opposite and that they you know the typical athlete that never lets themselves go easy it's always like a race every session is a race that is the chimp like really Uh, forcing them to go hard they can't even consider training with their heart rate below 160 beats per minute yeah, exactly you're, you're you're exactly right there and and so your chimp one of the other features is that it's kind of you're born with the chimp that you're born with and there's not much that you can do to change that your frontal cortex you can change your rational professor brain by education and learning but your chimp brain is kind of almost like on a biological lockdown and It's inherited, so you'll get you'll have a chimp, similar chimp to your both your parents. Things that happen to you in utero. So, for example, one of the things that drives your limbic system, aspects of our limbic system, like what we call your amygdala sensitivity, is like how much stress that was or circulating cortisol was in your mother's bloodstream while she was pregnant with you. So you're born out into the world with a limbic system that is already primed to be very scared of things or on a continuum or like not bothered by things at all. And there are little tests that they give to babies, in fact, that you can see what that reaction is like. And it's usually based on the startle reflex, a little puff of wind in your eyes and how much you shy away from sharp noises or something is a little indicator of how active your chimp is. But because our frontal cortex is almost like playing chimp parent all the time, like uh, if all we had was a chimp, we'd be in jail because we'd steal whatever we wanted. We'd hump whatever we were attracted to. We'd tell people whatever we thought of them. We don't care about hurting people's feelings. It's so selfish, survival, procreation for you. So our professor brain is constantly giving us a social conscience it's making us moral it's making us more hate healthy decisions so if you have a professor brain that isn't very well developed 
uh, or, or trained or has had trauma or it's, it's been addled by drugs, you're going to see or you pour ethanol over it, you get drunk. You're, you're removing the parental or impeding the parental part and you're seeing what someone's true chimp is actually like. So this is why, you know, there are we the sort of the, you, there are aggressive drunks and there are sleepy, you know, uh, romantic drunks and there are you're really seeing you're stripping away professor brain oversight and seeing the kind of pro- chimp brain that you're actually dealing with. Uh, and some people are in jail literally because their chimps are running their lives. They don't have good impulse control. They don't make good socially and morally or legal decisions in the moment, weighing up everything, you know. So it's a struggle. And this is one of the reasons why education or training your parent, Professor Brain, is such a good bang for your buck. It's a thing that helps our our quality of life improve across the board, not just helping being cope with nerves prior to a child that that is all super interesting uh, j- just a bit of a funny side note on on that being an aggressive drunk it's something that i read i'm not not sure if it's true <laughs> but i think i think it is actually that there was some research behind it at least that uh i'm from finland and uh Finns, finland is a pretty isolated country and in some ways uh or in many ways genetically quite homogenous and uh, one thing that apparently most Finns seem to be predisposed to is being aggressive drunks relative to the average person <laughs> in the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's really yeah, There's obviously these things are always, you know, the devil's in the details, right? So there are what we call contextual cues, your environment that makes us, that brings out tendencies. So in other words, for example, when we look at the effects of testosterone or alcohol on like mood states or behaviors uh, of people, um, It doesn't create a monster out of nothing. It basically just un- removes the barriers to the monster that's already within. I'm just using the word monster somewhat facetiously there. So yes, removing. So if you have a temperament to be overly aggressive, doing things that remove the little oversight that you have are going to make you even more aggressive. But if you have a, a fairly small puny chimp that doesn't get aggressive no amount of aggressive stuff you do is going to make them into a cage fight ufc fighting you know not bag it can make you feral and defend people that you love and whatever but it it can't actually make that now there's some really interesting research done in in mice and rats in neuroscience now they they even know the part of the brain that is a, acts as a switch To, to bring those tendencies out, regardless of your professor brain, so it's re- so you can turn scared, frightened mice into gladiator mice, and you can turn gladiator mice into scared, frightened mice by changing activation of this little part of our brain that sits above the roof of our mouth. We haven't done those studies in humans, partly because they're kind of unethical to do, yeah. right? And I'm not sure what we would do with that information, but. But now we're learning more about how you can turn on and off these strategies, not just, oh, you have to have a lot of drugs or alcohol or trauma to your cortex. <laughs> you, you mentioned how, having a well-developed professor brain or working on your professor brain mm-hmm. as being a good sort of parental control of the chimp brain. And what are some mm-hmm. specific things you can do in, uh, in developing that professor brain and, and being able yeah. to control the chimp better? Um, stay in school. Uh, uh, critical, thinking uh, skills, do, right? uh, critical thinking skills, the ability to evaluate uh, truth from from fiction, the ability to weight evidence, these other what we call executive function skills, a set of skills that really are located the the management of in our front in our professor brain, our frontal cortex, like the ability to concentrate and stay focused on something, the ability to resist temptation, what we call impulse control. All of these factors in that. So anything that you do to work on restraint, not giving into temptation, general education to make your frontal cortex go larger, denser, thicker, critical thinking skills are all going to help those things. So that's really what we do with kids, right? We try and you don't have a fully formed frontal cortex, professor brain, until you're in your mid-20s. And so if you've got anyone who has teens for kids or even worse, toddlers, right, who are toddlers are chimp brain. Their, their professor brain is just still like so undeveloped. You're just talking to a chimp, right? 
So all of the tactics that we use as parents that try to use professor brain tactics, use your words. Now, why is it wrong to hit Jimmy or why is it wrong to say you don't have the mental ability? It's all about using chimp management to talk the chimp down and teens when you have hormones that are driving so much of our psychosocial and sexual development, also running tremendous interference on our growing professor brain. So the ability to make sensible decisions in the presence of peer group, in the presence of a peer group that you want to impress is really difficult to do for all teens, right? As we know, as we know too well, some of us personally, personal first time experience. So we can develop, get older, stay in school, constantly do things that are working on frontal cortex skills, uh, do, find it like sport is a great example. What does sport force you to do? To be goal oriented, to be disciplined, to make yourself feel uncomfortable, to push through, to be persistent. All things that require frontal cortex skills as well. All good things to manage that chimp a little bit more. Yeah. Perfect. And I want to go into some specific um, examples uh, and use cases of this, but is there anything before that, that we have missed in terms of the general neuroscience and uh, brain uh, br- brain talk that we yeah, have? Uh, now there's, there's lots uh, that probably could be a whole, but I think that's the core piece at the moment is to understand this fight that the chimp purge is one strategy, a bunch of other quick strategies that work very quickly to calm your chimp down. But in essence, the fight is we've got to win or manage that fight well. Yeah, right. Well, I want to dig into some of the topics that you cover in the book. And uh, perhaps we can start with confidence. Leslie, maybe you want to to take this one. What, What can you tell us about confidence, how to build it and so on, even if you're not a confident person to start with? Well, you know, confidence really comes with uh, success Mm -hmm. and sort of side can maybe actually drill down because it it gets a bit more complex, Um, you know, but but definitely uh, from a confidence perspective, um, you know, mine started to build as I um, uh, did well at things. And, and, you know, again, Simon, I'll, I'll drill more into this, but there's so many different ways in which to, um, uh, assess success. And for me personally, a huge change in my athletic career was when I started to look at process goals rather than outcome goals. So being able to control things. Um, now, process goals can be as simple as, um, you know, did I manage my nutrition? Um, did I, you know, not let my hips drop during, you know, the run strides? Did I engage my glutes? You know, you can really break down an entire performance or session into these process goals. And so by doing that, I was forcing success in every single workout, uh, every single day. And so bit by bit, that just kind of built up and that success led to confidence. It led to outcomes actually being successful. Um, and, and that built on the on the confidence yeah. piece. In fact, all of the research, and this is one area that's been researched in psychology for decades, the strongest predictor of confidence is prior success, right? And it's a catch-22. I'm not successful, so how can I ever be confident? And I'm not confident because I've never been successful. So how can I? So this is the trap that many athletes face themselves. So the, the, the clue, no surprise, as Leslie alluded to, is how do we build in, if you, do, if you lack some confidence, we need you to feel successful on a regular basis. How do we do that? We need to find things where the outcome is always in your control. The outcome of the time that you ran or the, the pace that you kept Lots of reasons why that can be up and down and may not always be, or even just placing in a race, right? There's other people there who may be fitter. You don't have control over their fitness. So having this process focus of things that you can control and saying, see, I'm improving because I didn't do that. I didn't manage my nutrition last time, but now I did. I nailed it. That's a win. If you want to focus on outcomes like you know, uh, paces or speeds, then you just break it up into much smaller manageable tasks. It's just trying to improve, for example, your, say, FTP on the bike by 2%, not try and go for 10% or by 2% or trying to complete your run loop in, you know, in 1% or 2% quicker time or something, small incremental things that you might have much more control over. And I think a lot of athletes, what they do now is, of course, with social media and all the rest of it, there's so much comparison. 
Um, and everyone is always comparing themselves to the best out there or the better ones or why am I always coming up short? There's that negativity bias. So I think for our athletes, just really tracking where they've come from and where they are now and not just in outcome goals, but the process ones. Yeah. You know, their ability to regularly uh, uh, do mobility exercises or commit to core or change their diet or, you know, uh, when things are not going right, how have they managed their uh, mental state of mind? You know, so there's so many different parameters and tracking that allows you to see your problem. Yeah. So a useful exercise that I have athletes do who are very outcome oriented they might lack some confidence. They're not processed. They don't like their focusing goals on technique or whatever happens to be. So you say, okay, here's what the elite athletes do. I'm going to give you a chessboard. I'm going to mail, physically mail you a chessboard, 64 squares. In every single square, I want you to write down an, a unique thing that you can accomplish about your, it could be in a week, you know, it could be a season, it could be a day, whatever, but it's a unique thing uh that's specific a process that's always under your control so it might be to to consume at least a thousand milligrams of sodium an hour in a hot race right it's the one thing and i can at the end of it i can know how many count check but most athletes when you give them the the, the chessboard exercise they get to like the first line or they've done eight squares okay i've run out of what else is there the elite athletes can fill out all 64 for the most part it might be something as simple as nailing down the sort of like insert or the the, 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 the drop in your shoe, getting the perfect fit for your shoes or the lay, the sort of lacing track, the kind of lacing things that you have, the kind of what you're using for sunscreen or what you're using to manage heat dissipation. Or, so you can do this exercise and you can give yourself a score out of 64. Like, did I do that or I didn't do that in this week? And that's how you did. So you want to get more confidence? I want to get 50 out of my 64 nailed as much of the time as possible. And you're shifting mindset about what we're telling athletes to look at and how they are gauging their performance. So when, when athletes finish races, we, as ours know all too well, we say to them, we want you to look us in the eye and tell us how we, and give yourself a grade on effort and your attitude, how hard you push and what your attitude was. And if you can give yourself A grade, A grade, we can't ask anything more of you. You might have been slow as crap. You might have had a terrible race. But if you've done, give yourself A, if I couldn't have done any more and I pushed us, we can't ask any more. Process focus, that's in your control. Yeah, no, that's I, I love that with uh, with the attitude and uh, and effort. Uh, that, that's a perfect example. And and defining your own sort of success criteria is a really good strategy. Like generally speaking, I I think, and not not just from like from this perspective, of course, but even so, because it's quite easy to just, as you said, Leslie, like start comparing yourself with others. And for example, it's easy to compare your how much are you training, what is your training volume, or uh, what is your power compared to others but but you can start you can define your success differently and, and then avoid being sucked into that comparison trap as well but one thing that i can't help but, but wonder is if you as an athlete like you have to believe what you're stating is your success criteria right like you can't just trick yourself into saying that this is now my new success criteria you have to actually have some personal buy-in in it is that right yeah, That's true. Yeah, one hundred percent. And I think you really have to have it across all different areas. Um, you know, weaknesses, strengths. Um, I think I learned pretty early on that I needed to create good process goals that were my strengths that I could always hang my hat on and always feel good about. But then always look to my weaknesses and say, you know, what are my downfalls and how can I create process goals around there that I can feel really good about if I've achieved? And you have to be really careful about when you are assessing those things. You know, don't don't assess those things or, or create really tough uh, uh, process goals um, to achieve if you uh, have had a week of shitty sleep. Uh, if you've got a really stressful time at work, um, mm -hmm. if you're having arguments with your partner. So just understanding the level of stress that you're under and when to push the right buttons is going to help you manipulate that. Um, and again, that comes down to, well, another part of your brain, which I can kind of dig into as well if you want them to, uh, but just, you know, how we assess discomfort, emotional and physical, and um, parts of our brain that change and uh, get denser and stronger as a yeah. consequence and help us uh, the next time that we're, we're faced with adversity. 
I will say just to add on to the confidence thing. So we often talk about self-confidence as, as we all kind of know, it's the, it's the perceptions of your abilities. It, they don't have to be correlated with reality as at all, as we all know too well, right? Yeah. Athletes who are much better than they think they are or athletes who are, think they're a lot better than they actually are, right? So it's all about your perception of your abilities. And that rating that we give ourselves, what we know as self-confidence, is just one way that the human brain judges itself. So in our book, we give this metaphor of a tree. And the tree of having roots beneath the surface, the trunk, branches, and leaves, represent different aspects of our self-judgment system. So self-confidence is the, are simply the branches of our self-judgment system. And the reason they're branches is because I can be, they one branch is independent of another branch. So I can be really confident as a biker, but have low confidence as a swimmer, right? How can that be? But you're confident. Yeah, but my confidence in what is situation specific. Now, the, the leaves on those branches are what psychologists call self-efficacy. And that is now an even more specific type of self-confidence. And that is like, so take the swimming. I'm not a very confident swimmer, uh, but I'm really good at, um, at uh, sort of uh, ocean starts, starting into big waves or swimming in a group. But once I get out there, pacing my effort, I'm terrible. So now I've got like, the, well, it's, it's really nuanced. I've got high self-efficacy to get in and out the water, but low efficacy to get round intensity. Biking is the same. Great climber, terrible at descending. I've got confidence in one, none in the other, all within the same sport. So when you go down the tree to the trunk, which is what self-esteem is, self-esteem is my generalized sense of my abilities. And then you've got roots under the surface, which is what we think of your self-worth as a human. Am I a worthwhile human, capable or worthy of love and affection and so on? So if your confidence in sport is because your, your trunk is a bit wonky or your roots are rotted, you actually need different help than, listen, my self-worth is fine. My self-esteem is fine. I'm just not very good at triathlon or the leaf problem, the efficacy. I'm just not very good at descending on my bike. I don't need to try and correct or work on your self-belief or esteem or self-worth. But if the tree and the, the trunk and the roots are rotten, no amount of getting you good and open, you know, op uh, uh, starting into waves is going to fix the problem because the core is not good. So the first thing that we do is figure out where in the tree the problem is. So it's easy to know, like, OK, do, do you have this problem? Are you generally nervous about being in front of other people or being judged? You're about, no, I'm fine at work. It's just this. OK, so it's not a tree trunk problem. It's a branch problem. Yeah, I'm kind of nervous about that as well. I'm just a nervous kind of person. I'm just not very sure. I have imposter syndrome and lots of things I do. OK, it's a, probably a tree trunk problem. OK, so do you think uh, that are you in a relate? No, I'm not. In a, why not? Well, then no one would love me. I'm just like, you know, OK, it might be a self-worth problem. So each of the time you're trying to figure that out. And the reason that's important is because if I give someone who has a root or a trunk problem a small goal for them to feel successful in, the goal might be so small, like, OK, just like um, get into this water. There's no waves. Just dive in. Don't you feel confident now? There will be someone with a, a bad root and trunk problem, low self, they'll just say, yeah, but you've made it so easy now that it's, of course, anybody can do that. So I'm not feeling more confident because the problem is deeper than that. They they see everything as a through that lens. So this is why it's quite a little bit nuanced than just saying someone saying they lack self-belief or they lack confidence. Uh, that, that is a great illustration of uh, of finding the problem and uh, the cause of the problem, so to say. And uh, I mean, we could go deeper into it, of course, but let's <laughs> let's tackle a couple of other topics. And we already talked a little bit about comparison and social media. So perhaps we can tackle them kind of hand in hand. <laughs> and uh, what are your general thoughts around how that impacts the psychology of athletes these days and some tips around handling and managing social media. Yeah, you know, I think that uh, so many athletes struggle because of that. They're not content. They don't have a level of gratitude. Uh, they don't focus on uh, their own journey because they're um, very obsessed and addicted to that comparison. Uh, and as a consequence, I think uh, there's so much fear 
They don't want to really push those boundaries, put themselves out there or potentially fail because they don't want to come up short. And it really uh, changes the choices that they make, both about the training that they do, the races that they do, um, you know, and all of that. Um, so they're not really getting, they're not having an authentic experience as an athlete because they're so caught up in, in the comparison. Yeah. And your brain, the human brain is wired to compare itself to others. We are social animals. We're tribal. We've known this for, you know, scientifically anyway, for, for decades and decades. And if you try, this is the now powered, the strength, chimp brain, five times quicker, five times stronger. If you try and force your brain to not compare yourself to others, you will lose that fight every time because the human brain is wired when you're presented with new information, the human brain will do two things. It will say, what does this mean? And is that any good, right? So if I, if I, if I measure something about you and saying, oh, okay, because you've got a score, I clip something onto your shoulder, you got a score of 12. Well, what does that mean? 12 what? Okay, well, it means this, 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 the physio. Well, is that any good? Is 12 good? Should I? Our brain wants to know where it sits in some social hierarchy. And in fact, mother nature will bludgeon you until you do compare yourself. So for years, that was fine because it was really hard to compare yourself unless you were put on a number and you saw where you stacked up. But now, of course, we've got Facebook and TikTok and uh, um, uh, um, Instagram and Strava and you know all of these ways that are telling us how we stack up. And we can, our brain cannot resist it. And, and if you try and resist it, it's futile. So then the exercise becomes, and we all do it ourselves. We're not just on the receiving end of, oh my God, the news is bad. We're all trying to get other people to think that we're higher in some hierarchy of fitness, attractiveness, intelligence, of getting, I've got my shit togetherness. We're always trying to curate other people's opinions of ourselves. And psychologists call this impression management. We are constantly trying to manage other people's impressions of us, not maliciously or arrogantly. We do it so subtly, like the clothes that we put on when we go out to meet people. We're changing out of sweats. Why? Because you want to look nice. And we're always doing it. And now the research shows that the effort that we put into the kinds of pictures that we post on Instagram or Facebook are thought over and deliberated some some which subconsciously to to portray us in a way that moves us up some ladder in that hierarchy so when other people we do the same for others so the the, the real sort of the paradox or the cruelty of social media is impression management software right it's being forced in our faces where we sit you're not as quick. You're not as dedicated. You don't suffer as much. You're not as don't have as many QOMs or KOMs or you know whatever, whatever. All of the time is sitting us, and we've got to try and combat that if we're trying to right our sense of because these are all chimp ego threats. You're not as good. You're lower in the totem pole on that social ladder than you thought you were. And years ago, that would have meant death because you, the weak, get left behind, right? But nowadays, it doesn't. So we're always trying to manage that process. So if we can't win the battle with the chimp there in <laughs> not comparing us to others, then um, how, 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 do we, how do we go about having social media? Do we have to delete our accounts? Well, the first thing is just recognizing that what you're looking at in other people's feed is a very distorted view of, of reality. And in fact, some of the research comes, and it's been done on Facebook, and even though that's kind of a bit more of a dated social media app now, is that the more perfect it looks, the worse the situation usually is, right? So people's tendency to make everything out to be more badass, fitter, stronger, amazing, humble bragging, usually the worst things actually are. This goes for across multiple domains and so not just in sport about how competent your, or, you know, smart and attractive your family is or, or how good your relationship is, you know, is usually inversely correlated with what you actually show. So recognizing that you're watching or looking at the highlight reel of someone's life and it's not actually reality. That's the first thing. The second thing that we've learned is if all you do is is um, stalk and graze, meaning I go on other what I look at other people doing, I don't actually contribute, 
that combination of things is worse for your own self-confidence. So in other words, if you don't participate, I don't post, I just watch I, or I, I follow very specific people or I graze. I just look at what people are doing, but I never participate. Whilst you might think, well, I'm not putting myself out there, so I'm protecting my ego, that actually has the opposite effect, your mental health. Because all you're doing is you're not having a broadcast signal, you're having just an input signal. And impression management works both ways. I need to broadcast to the world that I'm higher in my ladder, not just take other people's broadcasts. So participate in that helps as well, is one real thing. So knowing what you're seeing is not true, participating in it cautiously and carefully when you can is helpful. And I will say the more general principle of just trying to not have constant access to that stream. So only having Facebook or Instagram on your PC versus only on your phone or not making a point of only checking that stuff once a day versus 10 times a day while I'm at a traffic light or I'm waiting in line or I'm doing something else. Because all your brain, all your chimp is hearing constantly, you don't stack up, you're not fit enough, you're not strong enough, you have less attractive friends, you have a, a, a dumber family or whatever, you know, whatever the chimp nonsense are, is saying. So those are some things that can really help. But the problem's only getting worse, not better. Mm, yeah. Uh, that, the, the one about participation is really interesting and counterintuitive to what I would have believed. So, yeah, uh, really is. interesting. Well, here's another counterintuitive finding is that when the hu humans bond, you build trusted relationships, trusted, meaningful relationships. You bond on weaknesses and vulnerabilities. You don't bond on strengths. When you, when you portray a strength to someone, this is what I'm good at. This is how I, amazing I am. This is how I, what does that do to other people's egos? It puts them on the defensive because what they're saying is I'm higher on this ladder of fitness, attractiveness, intelligence. I'm higher than you are. And nobody gets trusted relationships. It might feel good to you, but it doesn't. You bond on relationships that are vulnerable. So when you say, when you tell people about the things you're not good at, When you tell people about how you spectacularly failed at something or you screwed up or messed up, up at, whilst your chimp does not want you to do that, what you, are you crazy telling people the truth about stuff? But when you do that, you don't get, on, especially on social media, your worst chimp fears are you're going to get ridiculed and laughed at or thought less of. You actually get the opposite. People come out and are supportive and encouraging of you. But none of us actually want to do it. So my like little one-two punch for social media is participate and show weakness and vulnerability. And you will be surprised if you have the strength, the mental strength to say, oh, my God, I hope this doesn't end with me getting ridiculed. If you're able to ride that out, you'll find that you actually is a much more well-rounded way of developing confidence and having a healthy relationship with social media. People are relieved that someone is showing weakness about it that, that is that is fascinating uh really really interesting stuff uh let's do one more topic and um i'll let you two choose uh, do you want to talk about uh either leaving the comfort zone and learning to embrace the suck or alternatively uh talking about habits slash goal setting I would prefer to cover Embrace the Suck because I think <laughs> that, that really is the essence of, of everything that, that we stand for. And it's the reason why I've been successful in sport. Um, I think I probably learned early on that, that facing adversity makes you stronger in the end. I don't know why I'm driven by that, but I always have been from playing rugby uh, as the only girl on an all boys team from the age of, you know, seven to 12 to, you know, always choosing the hardest way to do something. It just seems to be in my DNA. Um, and I really, once I kind of broke down why that can make you successful as a person, that was an absolute light bulb for me because it meant that uh, I sought out adversity. I um, uh, commended failure because i saw that as a way to succeed can you, can you give some examples of seeking out adversity what what, what have you done uh yeah so um oh. so, uh, uh, yeah so i basically so there's a local hill near us called palomar mountain which is four and a half thousand foot climb and you know most people it's an epic just to go up at once and uh in a session i'll do it three times 
uh, the first time in the big chain ring, the second time is, you know, sprints 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, and the last time, uh, you know, just kind of making it up there. So choosing something that is outrageous and then doing it, you know, uh, again and again and again to the point where you're kind of, I don't know if I can do this. Yeah. Um, or, um, you know, going out and doing a race where everyone's expecting me to do really well. And it's maybe not that of an important race to me or it's not like an A race or anything like that. But purposefully tidying myself out or putting myself in a compromised position um, so that I'm turning up before the race. So I'm putting myself in adverse scenarios before I even race to learn to face what might come at me by doing that and again sort of getting into the sort of brain chemistry yeah. and this part of our brain um, that can morph and change with neuroplasticity and get stronger and denser as a consequence and make us better the next time. And, and whilst this, I mean, this is not this is not a novel concept, right? Anybody who's an athlete and coaches, the principle of overload, I have to do more. And when I recover, I'm getting fitter. I'm, adapt, I'm adapting to the training load by constantly having that level of overload. Your hu the human brain and, and mind, which is an emergent property of your brain physiology, is exactly the same. Unless you put yourself in mentally uncomfortable situations, lo and behold, you never get better at performing in mentally uncomfortable situations. You cannot learn mental toughness. You have to earn it. And you have to earn it. So this go, you know, reading our book will rationalize it and tell you what to do, but it won't make you mentally tough. You have to go out there, put yourself in those situations. So the analogy I always love is imagine if you you got a toddler on a high chair and you gave the toddler a wine glass and the toddler will drop it or throw it and it will shatter. That's the end of the wine glass. You could try and stitch it back together or so on. It's not a it's a fragile piece of uh, it's a fragile object. You give them a, a plastic sippy cup and they'll drop that and it'll get dented, scratched. It will be slightly deformed, but still usable. It's now a more resilient device but it's not getting stronger because it's dropped it's just getting it's got more scars on it and war wounds the human brain is equivalent to dropping something that when it gets dropped it gets stronger because it was dropped because it somehow reshapes and molds itself through this principle called neuroplasticity our brain is physically changing in response to the environments that we put it in so what does this mean for everyday athletes, it means you need to have training sessions, which are mental toughness sessions. So what does that mean? Well, is when you look at a session, if you're lucky enough to have a coach that sets you a session, you look at it and you say, yeah, I can do that. It's going to be hard. It's going to be miserable, but I can do that. How certain are you that you can do that? I'm 100% certain. It's not a mental toughness session. Doesn't mean it's not going to hurt. Doesn't mean it's not going to, you know, be a, str a struggle, a beneficial. Uh, but a mental toughness session from the, some of the goal setting research is that if that sweet spot seems to be about a seven to eight out of ten. So in other words, how what's the chance of you actually doing this as written? Well, I don't know. It's about a seven or eight out of ten. I think I can pull this off. So fifty fifty is too unmotivating. I don't know. I, I have no idea. 90%, 100% is not motivating enough. The 70 to 80%. So we like it when athletes say to us, they don't know this. Who do you think I am? I'm not, I'm not a professional athlete like you. I can't do this. Oh, that's perfect. We've got them in that mindset. Well, just do your best. Try. And we have a whole bunch of techniques to get them once they've started to continue on in the seven or eight out of tens. But the moment you pull off a seven out of 10 session, and it might, you might only have one out of three that you're able to pull off. The line in the sand, your brain is drawing, oh, my God, I can do that now. Confidence driven by success. Oh, my God, I can get them now. I think I can do so. When Leslie starts on the start line, while she might not be the most genetically talented athlete on the start line, she'll look at everybody's and say, I have out prepared every single one of you. You will have done one of these hill repeats. I've done three. You will have done this. I will have done that. And the principle is races are not won and lost on tailwinds downhill. They are won and lost when shit gets hard, when everybody is suffering. They're throwing the towel in, a brutal headwind, there's mud, it's miserable conditions. That is when the elite athletes separate themselves from the rest. So you need to practice the ability to do that. And that's what Leslie's done at Nauseam. And all of her 
big wins have come when conditions have been terrible or most people have looked out the window and said, oh God, why of all days today? Les is like, oh, bring it on. It's a chance for my chimp to be tested because I know my chimp is tougher than your chimp for throwing the towel in. Yeah, it's uh, it's the same thing about, you know, training when it rains. Like, even though you have the opportunity to train on the indoor trainer, maybe once in a while take the bike out and do a hard session outdoors in, in heavy rain because it might rain on race day. And uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, in, in terms yeah. of uh, scheduling this mental toughness session, I'm really curious how how regularly do do you do that for athletes or how, how many of their sessions might be the ones that they're not yeah. quite sure if they can do? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it just really depends on on what phase of training that they're in and what constitutes a mental toughness session for them. For some people, that might be uh, very different from another person. For some folks, it might be doing a group ride is incredibly stressful for them uh, or a mental toughness day. For other people, that might might you know, it'd be an easier for them to, uh, easier session for them to do. So it's understanding what makes a mental toughness session for each individual athlete. That's really critical. And then understanding what stress load they are under, both physically and mentally in their lives and doling it out based on that. So you can put more of those in, maybe as you're coming towards a race and they have more recovery around it, or, you know, they're going through a phase in their lives where maybe work isn't as stressful, you can do a bit more of it. Um, But we get our athletes to fill out diaries for us, uh, you know, on training peaks about where they're at from a mental perspective. So we can really analyze how much and when we give that to each individual athlete. But I, 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 as a rule of thumb, I would say if you're not doing a mental toughness session every couple of weeks, you probably want to revisit how hard your training is. I'm not talking about, again, sessions that are difficult and hard, but you get know that you can do them. Sessions that are deliberately designed for you to question whether you can complete this. That's the key part. So too many of them, and they just become unmotivating and exhausting. exhausting. And the other thing that we've known from some of the neuroscience research, again, this is a gross simplification, but there are parts of our brain, one in particular called the anterior cingulate cortex. It sits about a few inches behind our eye, it feels like a little sausage, that is key in processing discomfort cues. And so in response to discomfort, it gets thicker and larger, it gets denser and bigger. And so people who have very good endurance or some of the research shows that who have very good ability to tolerate that stuff generally have bigger anterior cingulate cortexes. So we need to try and develop that. So the other thing that we've now learned is that the part of our brain that processes effort is also processing emotional stress. So pain in brain world, physical pain, a needle pinprick, is felt the same as financial stress. It doesn't distinguish between the two. So think of it like a bank account. Every time I write a check to cope with you know, a failing marriage or, or financial stress or shit that's going on in my life, I'm writing a check from the same bank that's telling, enabling me to put into cope with hard physical discomfort. So the 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 goal here for athletes is if you want to give the best effort you can possibly, you need to lay off or try and give yourself a temporary reprieve from some emotional distress. Now, a lot of us don't have that option, right? I've got fat your families and I can't do. But if you do have the option to be able to manipulate some of those things a little bit more carefully, it's going to help you. And a good example of this is at the Tour de France, in fact. There are typically two rest days in the the Tour de France. There have been three, but rest days. So what do we let athletes do in their rest? What about, you know, seeing your family that you haven't seen for a week or 10 days and having spending some time with your kids and learning about what's happening at home? Seems like a good idea, right? Mentally, intuitively, but it's actually having the opposite effect because there's still an emotional price you're paying. Oh, my God, I, I realised how much I'm missing my kids. Or, oh, my God, I'm, I didn't know that so-and-so was getting sick down the road. It's an emotional toll. It's affecting your ability to pedal, right? So we try and keep people in bubbles, sort of away from all that stuff so that they can use their precious resources as much as possible. And vice versa, if you are physically distressed or exhausted all the time, your ability to tolerate emotional stuff will be impaired. I can't face talking about that now. Can we talk about it later? I just don't want to, we know that intuitively. So 
we can periodize the strain on this part of our brain as well. Yeah, and, and I would assume that also the, it, how often you do those sessions might depend on the confidence of the athlete as well, because uh, as we talked about, uh, you want to basically build confidence by having success. So you want to, if you are maybe less confident, you want more sessions that are really set up for you to be successful with pretty much yeah, certainty. Right. That's at least my coaching philosophy and for, for most athletes, but but the frequency with which you give them those really hard sessions that you're not sure whether they can handle or not depends quite a bit in my coaching philosophy, at least on the personality of the athlete, because some are a bit exactly. more curious about whether they can do something or not, whereas some other people yes. might see it more as a failure if they cannot do it or even if they can do it but it feels really really hard so yeah that's exactly. that, and that's the entire philosophy of our coaching base is get to know your athlete you need to know how they tick you know their their emotional side as well as their physical side and that's that's the key to everything i think as you said yeah, yeah. Totally. Uh, i'm conscious that leslie has to go very soon i want to uh, no sorry guys a couple minutes yeah, <laughs> you you can leave when when you need to I, I just want to get into one question before we do the rapid fire questions but leslie you've already done them in your previous episode so we'll ask them of simon Great. so so this last question before that is other than reading your book the brave athlete how can athletes go about uh improving uh their psychological and mental skills uh, in sports and in life yeah. what are some other tips for that well i would say you know based on the principle is you have to earn it you can't just learn it you have to put yourselves in environments that either are pretty nerve-wracking scary or terrifying and you have to learn to jump hand in hand with your fear you're never going to win the fear, the fight against fear or anxiety uh, it's always going to be part of you. It's our brain chemistry. So learning to jump hand in hand with the fear and force yourself to do it. That's the way that you earn the ability to tolerate this a bit more. And for me, it would be being self-aware. So really getting to know how you tick and what your strengths and weaknesses are and why. Uh, so what your, you know, your, your chimp is, what your inner emotional workings are. Um, and, and that can really help you move beyond that. So, so you would also, essentially you could, take Simon's strategy and then self-reflect around what, what happened when you put yourself in right. the situation and learn from that. And yeah, Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, then these are the rapid fire questions for Simon. And these are one sentence uh, questions and answers. And the first one is, what's your favorite book, blog, or resource related to endurance sports or to psychology if you want to? A uh, favorite one, uh, well, they all serve different purposes. One of my favorite books is Endure by Alex Hutchinson. Yeah. It's about the psychology of the curious limits of, uh, or, sorry, the psychology of endurance performance. It's a great read and it talks, you know, really proud. So Endure would be one of my top picks. It's the most recommended, the, the most common answer to this question on this entire podcast. In, in oh, it? it's, just a, it's, a great, it's a great book. There are, there are other books that are fantastic for understanding the human brain a bit more. They're not endurance sport specific, but they're like training to be a car mechanic specific. And one of those is called Behave by Robert Sapolsky. Uh, Behave, it's mm -hmm. called. It's basically a, like a, a, a history of the human brain and why it is the way it is. It's fantastic. Right. And uh, next, who's somebody that has inspired you? Uh, well, in addition to obviously my wife, who kicks ass and is incredible, um, I think in sport... I, I love athletes who are, um, they, they push and persist despite impediments or despite things that are getting in their way. It might be lack of physical ability or talent, or whatever, but it's those that really push through boundaries. So when I look, when, and, and again, it's not necessarily picking people out, but when I go to a race uh, and I watch people's face in the last sort of one kilometer, two kilometers, and you look at those people that are, they're summoning every ounce and it's an agony. I love those people because I know that they are going through the ultimate chimp fight internally versus the everything looks smooth and calm and in control. I love to witness, facially witness people going to hell and back because it tells me that I know what that battle they're fighting and how strong it is. So I, I just adore seeing that in people. Mm. And finally, what's a personal habit that's helped you achieve success? Uh, oh, that's a good one. Um, probably a couple. My one is that I started about four years ago was committing to read a book a week. All right. And the way I do it, I predominantly read um, fiction, 
Uh, well, no, actually predominantly read non-fiction with occasional fiction. So books like we're talking about in my field. And I take a book uh, for the week. I have usually two or three books in advance because the weeks come. I order them on Amazon. I look at the book for the week. I divide the number of pages by seven. And that's what I, the number of pages is what I have to read on a Monday morning. And I devote uh, usually an hour very early in the morning to do all the reading. And, I, and I've managed to get through a book a week, 52 books a year, which sounds incredible. But once you get into this habit of the page goal each day, is it becomes manageable. That is fantastic. And uh, finally, uh, where can people find out more about you and uh, your book and uh, your coaching business and everything you've got going on? Yeah, they can. That's a great. Thank you for asking us that. They can go onto our website, which is braveheartcoach.com, braveheartcoach.com. Uh, and there, there is also not just information about a book, about us, our backgrounds, but also there's what we call a smog test in, in the US or an MOT test in Britain is you, you fill out a little form about the training that you're doing at the moment, uh, what you're trying to get better at, and let and you leave uh, contact details, and Leslie or I will call you and have a 10-minute uh, free chat, no strings. We're not trying to get you to take on our coaching, just about your training. And we've done this now for years, and it's a really you – know, some end up coming training with us, others, they're just like, oh, my coach does this, and I'm only interested in what another coach might do. So the smog test on our website is another great thing, all found on braveheartcoach.com. Perfect. And we'll have the link to that in the show notes. Uh, thank you so much, Simon. It's uh, been a great pleasure. Leslie has already left uh, the room just for <laughs> listeners' yeah. information. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's been fascinating. And uh, and I want to thank you for writing that book. It was uh, I listened to it two years ago, I think, in the summer, uh, driving down from Lisbon to to Gibraltar for a race, actually, oh, okay. I remember. Yeah. And, and it was, it, the, the drive passed by really, really quickly listening to, to that book. It was so fascinating. Oh, thank you. I remember the, the exercises in the hard copy, but also if you've got the audio book, you can get the download for free, the PDFs of the exercises to do. So, yeah, we are forever grateful for that uh, and the fact that our book is resonating with athletes and non-athletes alike. So we're happy. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks again. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Simon and Leslie. As always, you can find the show notes on scientifictriathlon.com. I will link to all of the relevant profiles and web pages for both Simon and Leslie. And of course, to their book, which, as I've said several times now, uh, I highly, highly recommend that you read or listen to on Audible. Uh, it is great uh, and, uh, and really, really enjoyable. Uh, I also link to a category archive for all the previous sports psychology episodes that we've had on that triathlon show in the show notes and the episode description if you want to check them out now uh, i want to remind you that we have new training plans launched and you can find them on the training plans page on scientific triathlon.com the new plans are the advanced versions for olympic distance half distance and full distance triathlon and they are available for 60 percent off during the launch period so 30 us dollars on training peaks rather than 75 us dollars and that is with the promo code advanced at checkout this launch period lasts until the 30th of april 2021 so take advantage of it while you can Finally, big thanks to our sponsors, Roka, that you can find on roka.com. Check out their wetsuits, tri suits, swim skins, goggles, high performance eyewear, and prescription glasses and sunglasses, and get 20% off your order with the promo code that you can get on roka.com forward slash TTS. And thank you to Senate. Use the Senate Swim Trainer to improve your technique, power, and stamina, even when you don't have time to go to the pool or when pools are closed. Get 20% off your order with the promo code that you can get on senatesoontrainer.com forward slash TTS. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving craft love.